Okay, good morning everyone. Um, my, I'm Emma Keenan. I'm the Deputy Director of LUPC and welcome to our uh, Back to Work webinar today, which is the latest in our series of LUPC and SUPC collaborative events. Um, all public spaces are under now increasing pressure to enable people to return to operations as quickly but as safely as possible. And the government's easing of lockdown sets out some of the rules and regulations we, we need to follow, but the safety of our staff and students covers more than just that two metre rule and the barrier restrictions. Recognising the need to ensure that persons are not only safe, uh, but feel safe. Uh, considerations widen to include mental health factors, journeys to and from work or university and flexible working arrangements in time to come to incorporate what is now our new world. So I'm delighted today to introduce you to two fantastic speakers uh, whose presentations we hope will really help you and make the responsibilities you have over the coming months easier. Uh, 10.30, Professor Neil Budworth, who is the Chair of the University's Safety and Health Association, Usher. Uh, he's also the Health and Safety Risk Manager at Loughborough University. He's going to talk us through the range of considerations that are being made in a university context, both currently and looking to the future months and what we, we're going to need to plan to do. Firstly, uh, I'm going to hand over to Mars Woodman, who is the Procurement Officer at Crescent uh, Purchasing Consortium, who will introduce you to their new framework for the provision of PPE and related items. Hi there, Emma. Thank you for that. And uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the call today. Uh, as Emma described, um, I work for Crescent Purchase Consortium, um, looking after the PPE framework. Um, during the time when this was being retended, I don't think anyone saw uh, a pandemic coming. So it's been quite busy, unexpectedly. Uh, but today I'll just quickly um, run through about the new framework and uh, about different items as well. Um, so as it said, um, I'm Miles Woman, I'm one of the procurement officers. Uh, I look after a range of um, different uh, subject areas for CPC, uh, such as Harry Beauty as well, uh, but also mainly at the minute it's a lot of uh, PPE, clothing and uniform questions. So if you do have, um, have any questions for me after the webinar that you think of, uh, my contact details are there for you. So a brief agenda today about the, um, what we're going to go through, a bit of background about the framework, where it's come from. Uh, the award criteria that was used for the framework, uh, the lotting structure for the framework and what's covered under those, uh, the suppliers that have been successful and awarded to the framework, uh, a bit of background on the agreement set up, uh, details on the call off direct award and further competition uh, availability, uh, who's eligible to use the framework, what CPC are doing to support the sector, uh, some information on key PP items and guidance that I've um, found out working through the framework. Uh, and also some key considerations, and then, as Emma described, a Q&A at the end. Uh, so the first um, section on this we're going to go through is the background. Um, so to ensure that the next generation of this um, PPU framework met with our um, stakeholders' demands and um, expectations, really, uh, we undertook a couple of items of uh, engagement. So one of these was um, contacting the high usage members. This was a range of either colleges all the way up to big universities that have been using the past framework quite a lot, just to get their thoughts and feelings on what's gone well, what's not gone well, what they would like to see improved and different areas that they wanted to, items that wanted to be included in the next, um, next iteration of the framework. We also engaged with our other consortia colleagues who were a massive help as they had different members in CPC. So that gave another dimension of what was being asked from, from their members, such as um, remember a bulletproof vest was being asked for, which was a Quite a surprise to myself uh, and we also engaged them with um, the incumbent suppliers on the framework and also some new suppliers to make sure that we were staying within the marketplace we were still on track with what was being asked for what was being supplied has anything changed from the last four years what was asked for last time on the framework just to make sure it was applicable and up-to-date with what our members and what our suppliers are able to provide the button wasn't working uh, so to go through the award criteria, um, we've changed from last time, which was given more pricing orientated. So this time we've moved it to more customer requirement added value. As speaking with other consortia, they sort of helps us to understand more about um, sort of CSR and uh, finding out more about supply chain, where stuff comes from. There's been a lot of stories about um, districts of China where slave um, labour is still, unfortunately, still applicable and is still happening. So just to make sure that we are doing the most we can to vet the suppliers on the framework to make sure that they're sourcing from you know 
proper supply chains and modern, modern slavery isn't included in there. So this time price was given a lower priority and customer requirements and added value was given much more weighting and much more um, much more onus so that suppliers knew it was important to us and our members and people using the framework. So as you can see there, it was broken down 2030 and 50, which we thought gave it a nice broad, uh, broad scope for awarding. Yep. So for the framework coverage of the uh, lot structure, as you can see, it's broken down into uh, five lots. So there's PPE, clothing, uniforms, one stock shop and first aid. Uh, this was different from last time as it was 10 lots, which was much more broken out and a lot more confusing to use, which came from the member engagement. So this time we looked at and seen what we could do to make it more simplified, which was to include more clothing items into one lot, uniforms into one lot and keeping PPE and first aid separate. So as you can see there on the, on the slide, it shows you what's covered under um, all the lots. PPE has diversified a little bit, I must say, in the last couple of months. So more items are available, thankfully, under it, as well as first aid, but mainly covers what's described there. And it's it's been a nice mix of the suppliers have been able to sort of spread themselves to diversify more and be able to provide these items to our members. So it's nice to see that uh, they're, they're growing as well as the framework. Uh, so to show you the suppliers that have been awarded, we've got some new suppliers, which is nice to see that they're sort of changing and we've got more people on it. There is also more suppliers per lot than last time uh, to allow more coverage. And at the minute, we're thankful because they've also got more stock, uh, as well as the one-stop shop has also got more suppliers as well. So more coverage there for a member if they do require a full service from a supplier. Uh, and it's nice to also see that some of our incumbents and some bigger companies that have stayed on are still there to service members as well and it's nice to see their continued support with the framework as uh, it worked well last time and it's nice to see that they continue with that. So the agreement set up, uh, it was started on the 10th of May 2020 so just over a month old now and it's been one of the busiest frameworks we've had for a long time which is fantastic to say. Uh, it runs for the initial uh, two-year period to the 9th of May 2022 and then we've got the option to extend for a further two one-year periods up to 2024. So it's hoping at the minute it's looking good. We can uh, extend for another two years. Uh, and then, as I said before, it, it replaces the um, previous successful PPE framework, which expired on the 9th of May. Uh, and again, just a, a note there on the 10 lots becoming the five lots for ease of use and then a wider scope as well. So one of the options for uh, further competition through the framework, um, it, it's really down to the member of what they want to do, the choice of the contract. Uh, it should take into account the urgency of your need, uh, as well as the expected cost of requirements for EU thresholds and also um, quote thresholds as well, and also the complexity of the requirements. It could be very simple, but as soon as you start adding uh, personalization services, particularly on the clothing uniforms, lot, can be a lot more specialized, a lot more bespoke and can take a lot more time to um, manufacture. Um, CPC, as always, we recommend that carry out, uh, members carry out a further competition, inviting all the capable suppliers on the framework lot to participate. This just um, backs up, you know, helping you to best achieve what you require at the framework and add value to your opportunity. Uh, and then also, it's about the audibility as well and showing that you've um, gone down a EU compliant route to show that uh, you've done that due diligence and you've used suppliers that have been vetted, have been, you know, scoped beforehand to make it a bit easier and a bit quicker for you and more efficient to save you time and money at the end of the day because it can be quite a lengthy process to run a tender from, from scratch. So it's just there to help you out and, um, yeah, make sure you get the best for it. Another option that's available through the framework is... Um, Oh, sorry, to go into more detail on the call off. So, a further competition may be undertaken on the requirement, requirement basis. Um, so, you may wish to award to one supplier for a, a preset uh, period up to a maximum of four years, as described there. Um, we've also uh, produced template documentation for um, anyone using the framework to uh, assist you again, just so you don't have to create it from scratch. Um, and it's there to, with um, key terms in there and also what we've seen um, work over the last four years at the framework just so it's best scoped um, to make it a most efficient process for you and also the suppliers are aware of oh, aware of what's happening and uh, oh, sorry, I don't know what's happening now yeah 
to make sure this fires know where um, are familiar with the documents as well to make it a quicker turnaround as I can understand now as well that uh, with PPE in mind uh, there's not a lot of time scale and um, urgency is of a quite a high order so it's just there to help you make sure you're getting the most out of the framework even though it's a short turnaround time. So another option that we've seen uh, increase in popularity recently is direct award. Uh, so members may choose to use direct award to award to a supplier without having to engage into a further uh, competition process as direct award is a lot quicker of course. Uh, this mainly is used again where times are the effort essence and there uh, is an urgency where uh, further competition is unviable to members. So it's just again to help support you um, in these times especially when uh, PPE is of high demand and uh, there's not a lot of turnaround and uh, the government updates don't really give much time scale for, um, for people to procure items. So it's just there again to help you and help your institution to uh, get what you require and um, yeah, just make sure you're able to open again and uh, keep students uh, learning. Uh, members are able to determine uh, which supplier offers the best value for the required basket of goods by utilising the framework contract price list. So this is available within the user guide that's available on either the CPC website or um, the HEC website uh, through LUPC and SUPC. Uh, and again in there, it's just the prices that were submitted by the tenderers at, um, at uh, uh, for the competition stage. And it's there for you to make an informed judgment on uh, what items are listed there. Again, it's not a definitive list and there are more items available. So you are able to go further to the members, but it's just there to help you with the direct award process. So to show you some eligibility of who's able to use a framework, um, CPC are the contracting authority, but again, it's open to all the UK consortia, as well as other ones in uh, Scotland, Wales, and also Northern Ireland as well. I won't go too much into detail on those because it's a terrible thing to say. <laughs> and then just some detail on how CPC are supporting the sector. Um, so CPC are on hand to assist members using the framework to utilize all that is available to them automatically um, and guide them on how to get the most out of the framework for their institution so again with not having much time to um, procure items I've seen members uh, a bit I hate to use the word panicky but it does seem that way so it's just trying to best inform them of um, routes they can go down what the suppliers have got uh, what items are available what things are changing in the, in the sector uh, and as we described their CPC we are li liaising with suppliers on a weekly basis to gather the vital information so what I'm doing is um, emailing suppliers every week uh, to find out stock level and lead time data on key PPE items. Uh, they've been fantastic in their support with this. Uh, it's been about five weeks now and it's just getting more and more efficient every week, to, thankfully to say. And it's nice to know that members are finding this uh, very useful information and uh, it just helps us to show that, you know, there is a scope of this item and it might have a longer lead time, but members and suppliers are trying to get it. And, and speaking to them as well, they are saying that they're having to amend their supply chains and have a look for different routes to market themselves. Because uh, doing work with NHS, uh, I've seen massive numbers of gloves in particular, there's been billions of gloves bought, and it just swallows up all the production and supply. So are then are all suppliers um, that are not supplying NHS have got to sort of spot by on the, on the, um, on the short notice to get stock to members. So it's nice to know that they are working really hard to make sure they're meeting your demand. Uh, we also have a cr creation of our PPE Frequently Asked Questions blog. Uh, so this is available on the CPC website as well. Uh, this is just frequently asked questions that we're being asked by both CPC members and also other consortium members. And those are there to help you along. If you have the same thought, it's there to quickly find an answer to what's been asked for. So there's stuff on VAT exempt PPE items as well as uh, different routes to market, different items that could be available. It's just there to help, again, best inform you to um, enable you to open and get back to work. So briefly what I discussed there was key PPE items. So just so you can see on the left, li the list on the left there is some of the things we've been asking our, um, our suppliers details for. Um, in particular, antibacterial gel, gloves and masks are, I'm seeing a lot of um, demand for those. Uh, also as well with the mobile sanitizer stations and thermal scan thermometers, those were uh, relatively new things that weren't, um, weren't being asked for really uh, previously to the framework. So it's nice to know that our, our suppliers are trying to secure those for you. And um, again, with our weekly discussions, um, 
showcasing that there is more more stock coming in for, for these items so it's good to see because these are being demanded a lot more um another thing as well some guidance on pp items is you don't need to over specify what's uh, what's uh, what's out there for you so i know recently that the government made it uh, mandatory for public transport for masks to be worn so when you see stuff like ffp3 and uh, ffp2 mask ffp3 mask is one with a specialized filter that would more commonly be used in a clinical environment so when it says ffp2 and three ply masks those are more suited for um civilian use so again it's just making sure that you're not over specifying what what you need and um overpaying for it at the end of the day because again as demand increases so does uh, cost unfortunately so it's just to make sure that uh, yeah it's not being too over specified um again thermal scan thermometers and i've spoke with suppliers about this they don't um don't detect covid19 they detect a raise in temperature so it's just again knowing what your product does as well that you're using so it's not it's not giving you a yes or no answer to COVID-19. It's saying, yes, they've got a raised temperature. It's a caution. It's a, it's a concern that maybe they are um, infected with the, with the virus. But it's just, again, to, to guide you and uh, not take it as gospel, if you will. So, again, just some key considerations. Um, keep up to date with, with the... Um, with the date on the um, keep up today, sorry, with the current information, uh, government guidance, and lead time and stock level data, to ensure that you you're aware of what's happening within the um, within the sector, within the market, and um, to make sure that you you know you're best informed to guide people that may not know in your institution what's happening, and uh, that you've got a strong evidence base to help you reopen and help you stay safe and stay well. Um, there is links there within the presentation to the stock level data for this week, uh, which CPC will update every week and send out to the, the consortia, as well as links to relevant government guidance that's been uh, been published by um, DFE and um, other institute, other government bodies to help as well guide you uh, from a professional point of view. Um, as, yeah, and as well as the demand for a lot of key PP items has increased, uh, it's also good to be mindful that um, it may take longer to deliver. We've seen items such as the thermal thermometers and uh, gloves when the first demand for NHS went skyrocketed. Uh, that went up by about a month for, for simple gloves. So it's just to keep in mind that it's an ever-changing field and it could change daily. So it's just to make sure that you're keeping up to date with the data and uh, yeah, keeping yourself safe. Uh, and also where possible, uh, I know we discussed this earlier with the direct award and further competition processes, uh, to allow sufficient time for suppliers to respond to your requests. Uh, again, they're presently stretched with a high number of inquiries, so they've got less time to look at portals and look at tenders and be able to put a proper quote in. It's just, um, yeah, to help you along with uh, giving them more time to give a proper quote and get back to you, because um, we don't want you only getting one quote and it looking uh, like that's the only option for you. There is more options out there. It just takes a bit more time. And again, just a, a quick note on pricing. As I said, with demand, uh, pricing will increase. Um, so CPC are continuing to work with uh, the approved suppliers uh, on the framework to keep pricing as low as reasonable as possible to, to pack, despite increases. Uh, we'll only allow these increases um, uh, in line with the government PPN notices that have been published, as well as our terms and conditions, which time members to supply us with their open book costing data so we can see exactly what is happening and then we can you know help best inform you with our uh, with what information we've got to help you along and uh, you'll be happy to know that that's the end of my oh, sorry, end of my chat about ppa so thank you very much for listening and uh, as it said i'll be happy to take any questions now Miles, thank you very much that was fantastic and um, we much. have had a um, a few questions come through um it's really helpful what you're doing around contacting the suppliers with regards to stock levels. Can you just explain to us how that's being communicated out to consortia and how members um, who um, maybe aren't haven't been aware of this in the past could access that information? Of course. So, so what? So a bit about it. I email them on a Wednesday uh, for collection on a on a Friday, and again, they've been very helpful with this data. Uh, what I do then to submit it, it does go out on CPCs, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter pages. Um, so it is there for people to see. It also goes through our website. And then I also send it through to um, NWEPC for sharing through the Higher Education Consortia 
uh, groups. Um, and we also have it through our communicator tool on the CPC website. So um, keep checking LinkedIn, Facebook, and um, Twitter for CPC stuff, especially, but also other consortia as well. And the data will be there in, in, in essence. And uh, again, my details are there. If you ever need um, just an update on it, maybe I'm happy, very happy to send it out to anyone. Wonderful, thank you. Um, some a few questions around masks and what types of masks there are and what's available. Um, you know, it's a big topic, isn't it, at the minute? It is. Um, can the suppliers help, particularly if you're unclear about the specification that you need? Can the suppliers give advice on what you should be buying um, as well as what's required? Uh, short answer: Yes, of course. Um, our suppliers are very well well knowledgeable about this area, and they've had to. I think everyone's had to learn quickly on what's what's available. Mm -hmm. As I said there, there's a million different specs for everything, it seems, at the minute. So an FFP mask, FFP3 mask would be too high a spec, but a supplier would be able to advise you that even a simple cloth face covering one would uh, would suffice for a civilian um, for a civilian um, environment. But again, a three-ply mask also would uh, would be good as well. But yeah, the suppliers would be able to best advise on any items, really, that you've got a query about. Uh, they're there to support you as well as uh, everyone else, really. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and there's a question on um, MSDs and if they're available for items containing chemicals. I'm not sure if we... Uh, What's an MSD, sorry? I'm not sure, I'm afraid. <laughs> we can come back to that question, Miles. I'll, I'll follow up with the person who asked the question and we'll come thank back you. to you after the event. Um, and uh, is, do you have any information on VAT application for non-medical masks? Uh, from the institution themselves? Yes. Unfortunately, I don't know. Um, all I've got is data on the other side of it, what is a VAT exempt. Uh, what I would advise, though, is to um, I hate to say, search on Google, maybe, for um, application processes. Um, I found a lot of my data out through through Google, and it's been a massive help. I know that sounds a bit of a, a get-out clause, but it, it, there is a lot of data there with a the, uh, search, so it just helps you best inform from uh, from bodies. Ian, maybe as well to recommend looking on the government website. Uh, there's a lot of data. Okay from there has been very useful regarding VAT exemptions and processes and, and I imagine it would might, might go through HMRC as well so maybe that might be a bit. Great okay um, and MSD is a material safety data sheet um, I assume the um, suppliers will have all of the information pertaining to the specification of the items that they're selling so could provide these for the items that people are buying would that be right? Yes, yeah, so all the items that were specified at tender stage as well were um, asked to be compliant to relevant EU standards and also um, medical directives, uh, mm -hmm. hopefully. So yes, suppliers will have data on all items um, with the standards and um, ISOs and ENs and all that. Okay, um, there's some questions and some comments around what is VAT exempt and what isn't. What I will do is take an action away from this to produce a document from what we know. I'll work with uh, BUFTG um, and the tax specialist there to produce a document and we'll circulate that on, on the websites for all of the consortia so people have a, a good reference point for the future. Fantastic. Um, I think that's come to the end of the questions. Miles, thank you very much. That's been really helpful. Um, I know you, you shared your information. We'll share your, um, your slides and so people will have your, your um, contact details if they have any, any queries afterwards. So um, thank you again. No, thank you. Thank you, everyone. So our next speaker is Professor Neil Budworth. Um, he is the chair of the Uni University Safety and Health Association and also the health and safety risk manager at the University of Loughborough. And he's going to talk us through some kind of real considerations that are being made in a university environment now, and also thinking about for the future, uh, the challenges that might come based on different alert levels. Uh, so I am going to uh, hopefully hand over to Neil um, to, uh, to talk to you about that. Just using some technical things here, we'll make that happen. I think you're just on mute, maybe, Neil. Sorry, I've got a double Perfect. mute. Let me go back and start at the beginning, shall I? Thank you if very much. Possible. 
So one thing you didn't hear me say was uh, it all worked in practice and if it didn't, Grace was there to help us. So <laughs> thank you, Grace and Emma, for sorting that out. <laughs> uh, and thank you also for giving me the opportunity to talk this morning. Um, there is one thing I think we can all agree on, which is it's been a funny old year so far. You probably spent a lot more time than you expected looking on a view similar to this. Probably. So uh, obviously coronavirus has come along. It's made us completely change the way we work, move from our offices into the home overnight, pretty much, and created a huge amount of uncertainty about work, about the future, about finance. And all at a time when people are alone and breaking from their normal social networks, not only the work networks, but their home networks as well. It's all been disrupted. So essentially, as managers, our sole task is to uh, work people through the change curve, which I'll come on to for a moment. Sorry, the slides are getting a bit out of sync. Um, obviously, your work environment has changed as well. You had a, a, a comfortable office, so people are now working at home, and that, that experience has varied completely for different people. So the experience of somebody that has a home office set up with a good setup is completely different from somebody that's working in a flat, they're living by themselves and they have no access to outside space. Our task has really just been help to manage people through this change curve. It's all gonna be difficult for them and we know that people react differently and take longer to go through this before they adapt to change. Some do very quickly, some take a long time. So before I go on to easing the lockdown and uh, all of the things around that and the issues of the lockdown, I just want to say a second, uh, a few things for a second about uh, sector bodies. So this is the time I think when sector bodies actually have been shining. So they've been able to consult directly with the government, so the Department for Education, Bays, etc., and rapidly do a, check the practicality of what's been suggested nationally. We're also in a position where we're able to monitor and flag hot issues to the Department for Education, Bays, etc., and able to more effectively disseminate information uh, and guidance quickly. And as things start to emerge, because there's 100 or so universities on the on, on certainly our network, 130 plus, we can rapidly explore emerging issues and come to not a consensus, but we start to gain an understanding very rapidly. That allows us as a sector to kind of harmonize our approach. So moving into the easing of the lockdown, um, oddly going into lockdown, even though it required a huge amount of change, was relatively easy. You just did it. Coming out is a lot more complex. So most organizations have got some kind of business continuity or crisis management set up, normally with gold, silver, bronze groups. So strategic, tactical, operational. And, and I think they've been exercising that kind of fairly full capacity for the last three or four months. As we are in lockdown and coming out of it, there are things that are emerging. Firstly, physical and mental well-being. Secondly, the practical issues of returning to operations on a site that may have been shut down for a while. And then thirdly, thinking about what the future might be in the absence of anything that guides us to what it might look like. So by necessity, I'm going to use uh, Loughborough as some examples. So at Loughborough, people working from home, we recognise that that's different. And we recognise there's a number of elements to that. So uh, we've developed a website, and I think most universities have, have done something similar. And we've looked at four particular areas. So the first area is when you first go into lockdown, IT. You've got to get the IT working. That's a huge amount of stress if uh, if you can't do that. Secondly, there's a psychological element of working away from the university away from your social networks. And thirdly, there's the physical element of setting up your workstation. So I'll just step through a few of those. Uh, many people will start to work from home for the first time. And actually they needed some guidance in order to how to do that and keep themselves well during that process. So these are eight ways to be your 
best self whilst working from home. And I have to say, we had a degree of nervousness about sending guidance out that started to get, get dressed to some really highly educated and you know, very, very bright people. I thought we might get a lot of kickback, but actually it's been received in the way it was transmitted. That's been, people have been very grateful for the fact that we're helping them to put structure in the day and understand how to work safely and well at home. We know that the uh, key risk is around mental well-being. So again, many universities have enhanced their mental well-being offering, and you, you've probably been at the, the crux of trying to procure some of this stuff. So again, within Loughborough, we've taken our existing employee assistance program. That's a 24-hour helpline uh, that uh, many places have, and we've enhanced it to uh, look after family, immediate family as well. Uh, we've also worked with local uh, charities uh, called Rethink Your Mind, uh, to bring something called the yellow book and introduce the well-being portal. And you'll also see demand for things like resilience training uh, and training for managers to skill. And in our case, we've also Im implemented an app. So those are the things that are on people's agendas. You know, we provide what we can remotely to support mental well-being. But it's not just about that. There's a huge amount which is about connection. So you're used to working with people in an office or lab environment and having that connection, not just the formal stuff, but the informal uh, discussions in coffee areas around uh, well, water coolers, as the Americans call it. So we've tried to replicate that with the manager's guides that we do. How do you run a business meeting on Zoom, on Teams? These were the tools that were not really in uh, – common use before and now the, what we use every single day how do you do your ch team check-ins how do you keep an eye on somebody that uh, you might think might be offering a bit and how do you link the managers to those available support so an area of good practice we've seen is uh, one of our deans uh, did a virtual pub quiz called the the dean's head to replicate the kind of banter and discussion that you get outside of the formal discussions and that's gone down really well um, and in fact that fellow's uh, an absolute star continues to this day and is uh, a real success moving on to the practical of getting on campus the future is going to look somewhat different to the past so we know that at the moment there's a two meter rule in that may change but it may not so at the moment we're planning for two meter rules that fundamentally changes the way you can use your buildings so it takes your office capacity down to about 20 25 percent of what it was previously it takes chunks of your labs out it takes your it, it affects your kitchens it affects your loos so there's a lot of planning needs to go in in order to put social distancing in place properly and in fact what we need is a formal process so the processes we've adopted, which is very similar to all this, is firstly, we're requiring the leaders to act as leaders and say what their priorities are and to drive that. And just to make sure they're suitable for occupation. Uh, and there's a whole range of things that you need to check there. Probably the most critical being your Legionella, because it can take up to two to three weeks uh, to make sure that you do not have Legionella in your water system. So that could be your limiting factor about getting on site. But there's other things as well, lifting equipment, uh, whether your work equipment is okay, uh, whether your lifts are operational and been checked, whether the fire alarms are still working, whether the cleaning in place, etc. So once that's in place, you also need to make sure the social distancing is there. And also check that the other safety requirements are in place. So for example, COVID-19 risk assessment, do we understand if there's any impact on the area or the social distancing measures in place or safety critical systems like oxygen alarms in place, fire marshals, first aiders. And as you start to reoccupy campus, initially there's going to be a low number of staff. So loan working arrangements is cool. And of course, as we've been talking about, PPE becomes uh, important. And what we've seen is over time that the demands on purchasing change. So the first thing to go out of stock Masks of different types of specifications, then floor covering uh, signs and floor markings, face coverings as those have come in, perspex screens, 
visors and now we're into temperature monitoring equipment and seeing where those are and we're seeing the demand change over time as as people are in different phases of their reoccupation so now i'm going to look to the future and just a word of warning it viable as these two methods so um, please take it with a huge pinch of salt as you will be aware uh, there are the government in in england as but the UK has got five alert levels, these being those. And we're currently at level four. So COVID-19 is in general circulation, moving to level three, where there should be some gradual relaxation of social distancing. The question is, where are we going to be in September and October when we want to get back in full scale on site? Because it makes a big difference. So we anticipate we'll be around level two. So some social distancing but not as onerous as it is now that's all subject there could always be a second peak so it's probably as well to uh, plan for multiple scenarios because we don't quite know where we're going to be in terms of planning you're planning for an uncertainty so how do you do that well what we've done is to learn, look at international comparators, particularly what's been declared in Northern Ireland, because they've said what the next few phases will look like. What happened in New Zealand? Not that it's a direct comparator, because clearly it's a, it's a lot smaller. And also what's happened in New Zealand higher education sector. And very usefully, they have defined what each set area, sorry, what each level might look like. So, for example, at Northern Ireland level two, so that's where we expect to be kind of around September. You'll see that in place, although remote working is still encouraged, hospitality start to come back, maybe pubs just outside, we don't know. Uh, public transport operation full service, people start to meet in more extended groups, but with social distancing in place, physical contact sports back in place, and even nightclubs and concerts open on a limited basis with some social distancing. And again, usefully, what they do is they, they put some figures around this. So um, outdoor activities involving larger groups of less than 30, even if you can't quite maintain social distancing. So you know, having that level of, not detail, but the, the, those broad outlines give you some idea of the planning. Moving on to uh, New Zealand, they gave specific guidance on what universities could be expected to do at each alert level. They had four levels. So this is their level two, which I think broadly equates to our level two. So back on campus, some social distancing in place, required to have flexibility in order, if anything changes, to go back to remote teaching. But classes, lectures, labs, workshops, tutorials, back on site. Interestingly, at their level three, which is where we're heading, they brought into uh, this social bubble model. So the idea of the social bubble being, oh, the idea of the social bubble being is that you uh, get a group of students together who stay together outside of that group uh, and then because they're only exposed to each other, you can start to relax social distancing within that bubble. It's kind of like a household, but in an educational setting. Um, so although these don't give us the answers, what they do is to give us a trajectory. And just to summarize, because I'm conscious that questions are probably the most helpful thing. Coming out of lockdown, we say that health and well-being are going to be high on the agenda for the foreseeable future the whole national debate is around health and well-being and safety the international comparison doesn't give us the answers but it does give us a trajectory which helps us with our scenario planning and on that i'm going to uh, stop and take any questions neil that's been really really helpful thank you very much um can i just ask uh, from my perspective, what are the key departments that you need to engage with? Um, obviously, we all have our own responsibilities and our own roles, but I think communicating with other teams within universities is key to make sure that we're all um, uh, we're all joined up and can plan for for what we need. Um, are there kind of key groups of people? Do people have uh, you know planning teams already set up, and who who makes those up? So 
it depends what structures you've got. So most most have got this these um, you know, gold, silver, bronze types of groups. So your gold will be strategic, and that will have your senior leadership team on, and they'll set the broad direction. And then underneath that, normally there'll be uh, groups around. Well, not normally, but there, there will be groups looking at teaching and learning, and they'll need to know what can be done within the spaces. Uh, there'll be groups around accommodation, the student experience. Um, and of course, you've got to consult with the unions, and it's right to consult with the unions. Um, we know that uh, moving back on will require you know, us to purchase certain things, so signs, perspex screens, PPE. So purchasing need to be in that loop as well. And that was my next next question. I think is what what are the key areas of the best ways that procurement teams can help at this point in time? Well, if you're able to predict what's coming up. So, you know, ideally be ahead of the game and understand what signs might be needed and get them ready because we know that the market is tightening on those. We know there's likely to be tightening on the purpose, purpose screens and we know that masks and face coverings are going to be uh, difficult to come by. So uh, you, there was a discussion about masks and face coverings earlier. So the UK government talks about face coverings on things like uh, public transport and in shops where social distancing can't be maintained kind of unhelpfully the world health organization uses the term non-surgical face masks to mean the same thing so you, when you look at the documents internationally you, you can never quite be sure what they're talking about when they look at masks until you get into the details sometimes they mean mm. face coverings okay thank you um that crystal ball question how do you effectively plan a safe return to work when government may change the safe distancing rules within you know to um, from two to one meters within very short notice so i think all you can do is scenario plan mm -hmm. so the reality is in september we don't know whether we're going to be at level three four or two we can guess that we're going to be at two i think it's reasonable to predict that at some point the government will be under such a lot of pressure to relax the two meter rule they, they will do almost regardless of the science having said that at that point the, by that point the infection rate should be coming down so, so it's not a great risk so all you can do is scenario plan for a number of different events okay thank you and um in, in your role as the chair of usher um are you producing any guidelines for the sector that can be followed or should people be following government advice solely so what we're doing is firstly disseminating good practice. The, the challenge with developing guidance now is it's moving so quickly that if we try and develop it by committee, by the time it's out, it will be out of date. So what we're seeking to do is identify good practice in our members and disseminate that very quickly. Um, the second thing we're doing is we're engaging with government is uh, it would be helpful if they produced something similar to New Zealand or Northern Ireland that didn't give us anything that was prescripted or tied us down, but gave us a broad idea of what might be acceptable. You know, what are the limits of an acceptable group inside and outside at levels two, between two and three at level three? Because that allows you to plan your social activities, your halls, uh, and also your teaching activity. That's really useful. Thank you. Um, I think you've done an amazing job, Neil. We've got no more questions. Others, oh, one's just popped up. Will test kits be used in universities? I think that depends on who you ask. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, certain universities have said and guaranteed that they'll do tests within 24 hours. So I think Liverpool has been uh, said to international students they'll provide that. Um, I'm not quite sure how they plan to do that yet, whether it's test kits or whether they've got equipment on site to do it. There may be a demand in terms of reassurance. Um, others will just direct people to the NHS uh, test and trace service. Okay, thank you. And um, from your uh, discussions, have you any view or thoughts um, or information on when you think students will be returning um, in, into the main university campuses? Uh, again, what you've seen is big divergence in the sector. So you've got uh, Cambridge coming out and saying they're not going to be doing large lectures, it's all going to be tutorials. You've got Bolton that's saying that it's going to be uh, almost not quite business as normal, but they're going to have back on campus. I know, I think most universities are planning mixed on campus with some online stuff. Uh, certainly we expect to be on campus in uh, September, October uh, and operating as full of service as possible with any, with any restrictions that might be in place. 
Okay. And when it's come to the procurement of PPE and materials that you needed, who have you seen at Loughborough kind of leading the way on that? Has that been an estate's uh, requirement or uh, led uh, acquisition or of the work with procurement? Has procurement done it? Uh, I think, to be absolutely honest, it's kind of flexed. So in the early days, because of the the tightening of the market, what you saw is lots of people trying to go out and get things and actually then we brought it back into you know estates and procurement working together to get it uh, and i think there was a general scrabble early on for particularly like gel and gloves mm. and to some degrees masks where people were frustrated that the normal routes didn't work and tried to get other things and then there was a certain amount of trying to control that again and i, I don't okay. think that was untypical actually okay and, and you mentioned earlier the kind of different ways different universities are approaching uh, coming back into operation what's your view on and uh, offerings uh, face coverings for students <laughs> so the, i think this again is one that depends so if you're a london university where you've got people that are commuting in that's one situation if you're a rural, you're rural university you might not if you mm. a high proportion of um you know, overseas and chinese students you might want to do that in terms of uh, reassurance so we've seen i think liverpool and edinburgh that will be issuing or talking about issuing logoed face cover all the universities have been saying that they'll recommend them but not provide mm -hmm. so it's still a mixed bag and i think it's one that's still settling down yeah and and linked to that as well what do you think about um the requirement for staff to purchase their own masks or do you think it will be the responsibility of the university or organization to so do that legally if it is required by risk assessment so it's part of your job then we would need to be providing it if it's a kind of discretionary element then i think the universities have a choice what you might anticipate is that the mass starts to become a fashion item mm. um, as people want to express themselves through it so you could provide them but actually you'll probably find people want to get their own and express themselves through it particularly the kind of generation that we're talking about okay um with regards specifically to catering outlets in in university uh, on university sites when do you think they will likely open um do you think that'll be the last area to come back i think it'll be one of them i think they'll, they'll be aligned with the kind of pubs and restaurants um but as students come back in september october i don't see why you wouldn't have them on place as, as long as you can get your social distancing um in the first phase will be probably take away uh, and then as we get more experienced with social distancing and what it means for, if you like, the hospitality sector, mm -hmm. then they can be brought back on stream. Okay. Um, and a, a question around screens specifically. Will there be or is there any guidance on the set areas where these screens will be needed, for example, where staff meet students like income office or estates office? So uh, there is guidance. So there's guidance from uh, BES or the government guidance which tells you where to put them but you really have to work through the contact points so um obviously reception desks will um, become an area where it's you wouldn't want the member staff in ppe all day so therefore mm -hmm. screens become a, a much better option so it's a, yeah, it's a practical consideration um, Neil, that's absolutely fantastic. I think we are um, we are out of questions. Um, we've really valued your time today and what you've given us is some uh, really, as I mentioned, practical takeaways for people to think about, to talk with their other teams about. Um, I know we're going to share the, um, the slides and this presentation after the event with you, as well as a link to our YouTube channel that has been recorded. So you'll be able to watch it again or share it with others who might be interested. Um, our next event is on the 16th of June. Uh, we'll be focusing on efficiencies. Um, so it will feature a presentation from SUMS and also a presentation around the debt collection framework. Um, so uh, we will, we've got that information on our websites, but get in touch if you want any more information. And if there are any other topics of interest that you'd like us to consider in the future, um, please just drop us an email and, and be in touch. But otherwise, thank you very much for joining us today and um, we'll see you next time.